Good morning, I'm Rick, I live in River Church in Newcastle, um, and uh, we're going to be continuing in uh, the book of Acts this morning, um, and it's going to be, we're starting Acts 2, which is a fairly crucial part of Acts, a fairly crucial part of the Bible, and in fact a really crucial part of history. Uh, so I don't have loads of time to give much of an introduction. If you're new to this, you can catch up online on our YouTube channel, um, but to give you a little bit of an idea of, of where we're heading, um, this morning we're going to be in the language of family. It's going to be family business this morning because we're going to be talking about an anniversary, a birth, and an adoption. There's an anniversary, a birth, and an adoption. So if you have a Bible, uh, it might be worth having a look at Acts 2. If you don't, that's fine. I'll try and make this as clear as I can. Um, I'm reading from the ESV which says this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and that they is the disciples of Jesus. And suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, which is other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished. Not that they're amazed and astonished. There can't just be one. It's, it's so much. <laughs> and they said, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed. That seems better. They're opposite, aren't they? So. <laughs> Saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. I just want to pray to begin. Spirit, we thank you that you come to us. That you poured yourself out on the day of Pentecost. I pray, Lord, that I can preach your word faithfully this morning. And as I do so, would you come to us and would it be written on our hearts? Holy Spirit, we need you this morning. Amen. I used to work in a primary school, so I don't want to dazzle you with my maths knowledge, but a pentagon is a five-sided shape. Yeah? Oh, that's right. Because um, pent means five. Pentecost means 50, or 50th to be precise. That's because Pentecost uh, was, uh, for the Jews, the day that marked 50 days after the Sunday after Passover. Which is a bit complicated for a Christian, it's easier. It's 50 days after Easter Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. But crucially, they also celebrated Pentecost because it was the anniversary of the law being given on Mount Sinai. Now, I, I haven't been to see Tenet yet, um, but I'm a big fan of Christopher Nolan's films. I particularly like the way he plays with time. I think of Dunkirk, he tells the same story, you know, in three different timelines. Um, I'm going to do something similar here. I'm going to tell one story in three different time zones. Um, hopefully it won't be as confusing as Tenet. You had to see it twice, didn't you? Mm -hmm. To make sense of it. Hopefully you'll get it first time. On <laughs> because this happened 2,000 years ago, but we're going to take a little step back 1,500 years previous, three and a half thousand years ago from today, to the book of Exodus, which is the second book in the Bible. And in that book we find that the Israelites, the Jews, God's people, in slavery in Egypt. And then God sets them free. And on the night they are set free, they sacrifice and eat a lamb known as the Passover lamb. 
It was to be a, a perfect lamb, a lamb without defect. Its legs had to remain unbroken. It was seasoned with bitter herbs. They sacrificed it at twilight under the dark sky. And the blood of this lamb was taken and painted with a hyssop branch on the doorways of their homes. Because then when God came in judgment against their captors, he knew which house to pass over by the sign of this blood. The blood of the lamb marked at who was in and who was not in the people of God. Then leaving their captors behind, the, 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 the Israelites made their way to the border of Egypt, to the Red Sea. And their God, a bit like a Pentecost, breathed out his spirit, sent his wind, and the sea was split. And the Israelites passed safely through. Then in the, the wilderness beyond, he provided for their daily need with bread from heaven. No more or less than they had need for. And then finally... 50 days later, 50 days after the Passover that is, the 12 tribes of Israel arrived at the mountain called Sinai. And there, surrounded by wind, fire, and an awesome voice, the covenant of God was confirmed. The covenant which is the promise that he will be their God and they will be his people. And there, their leader Moses is given the law of God. The Ten Commandments. And this Exodus narrative defined Judaism. This story of salvation and revelation marked them out as the people of God. Those whom he passed over as he judged the world. Okay, let's, let's move back forwards into 30 AD, 40 AD or so when this was, 2,000 years ago, on the anniversary of Sinai. Where in one place the twelve apostles, the new Israel on the mountain now of Zion, which is Jerusalem, receive the promised spirit. Accompanied by wind, fire, and the voices from heaven, the covenant is confirmed. A new covenant prophesied by Jeremiah. It says, I will put my law within them. No longer written on tablets of stone like the Ten Commandments, but written on their hearts. I will write it on their hearts. I jumped the gun. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. We'll come back to that, least to greatest, later. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And let's move forward again to today. Because this is actually every Christian's story. Because Jesus is the last and best and eternal Passover lamb. The Bible talks of him as the lamb who is slain, the sacrifice without defect. Who though he was pierced at crucifixion, had his legs unbroken. Who tasted the bitter cup of punishment. Who died under a darkened sky. Who drank from a hyssop branch. And whose blood marks out who is and is not in the people of God. Because I, <laughs> I said that Pentecost is an anniversary. Well, it was actually more like a save the date. Because this was the real day, Pentecost. Jesus is the true salvation. And the cross of Jesus, the spotless lamb, when he was slain, that is the center point of all history. And every other date is fixed upon it. The Exodus narrative then is just a picture of our salvation. Slaves set free. Slaves to sin, slaves to fear, slaves to shame, now set free. When you put your faith in Jesus, in his death and resurrection, you are free. And free indeed. And now as Christians we actually follow this Exodus narrative. Because having been set free, we pass through water in baptism. We receive our daily bread in communion. And the law of God is written on our hearts as the Spirit meets us in power. Jesus is the new and better Lamb. Pentecost is the new and better Sinai. Okay, 
That was the anniversary. Now for the birth. Uh, Acts was written by a man called Luke, um, and he also, before this, uh, wrote a, a gospel, a story of, of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And in that, the first two chapters are given over to the promise and fulfillment of the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke then parallels this in Acts 1 and 2 with the promise and fulfillment of the birth of the body of Christ, his church. And just as the Holy Spirit descended upon Mary and Jesus was conceived, so here the Holy Spirit descends upon the womb of the collective disciples and the church is born. And suddenly, brought miraculously to life, the disciples begin witnessing to all those around them in Jerusalem. Just as a a, a zygote, a new life, splits and multiplies at an incredible rate, so does the church. Now there's this uh, list of countries that apparently the people spoke. I think that's probably Luke summing it up. Um, But uh, no one's really given a good reason for the order of the countries listed. But we know who they are. That's the known world at the time. You have uh, West Asians, Central Europeans, North Africans, all, all here. All in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And I know when you get to these Bibles, uh, bits in the Bible, it's very easy to skip over the names, isn't it? Because they don't really mean anything to us. It's kind of ancient places. But actually Parthians, Medes, Romans, Egyptians, these were all people who at one time or another had taken the Jews under captivity. Sometimes because of the Jews' own sin. And when they'd taken them, some of the, uh, in some of those countries, Jewish peoples remained. And they stayed and uh, adopted the, the culture of the country and learned the language. These are the diaspora, the dispersed, the, the scattered peoples of God. Um, and some of them then had made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem this day for the festival. And we see then in this passage that there is good news that all nations, all people groups are welcomed into God, regardless of their hostile history. But more than that, this passage tells us that the church's birth is not so much antenatal as anti-Babel. Anti, not antenatal, but anti babel Some of you know what I'm getting at. Because in Genesis 11, uh, there's a story of the Tower of Babel. Where, <laughs> when building their God-defying tower, those who were united in pride are scattered. And given different languages, no longer able to understand one another. At Pentecost... Those who had been scattered in shame were united in God, in voice, comprehending one another once again. The curse of Babel is removed. The dividing wall of hostility is down. Every people group can come to Jesus and a church is born. I don't really have time today. Uh, You can see I'm whizzing through as it is, but I don't have time to really pick out the gift of tongues. Um, if you've got questions, uh, Zoom me or uh, you know, we can go for a walk another day. Um, but I will say this, I think it's, uh, the gift of tongues is a gift we can receive today. I think it's also what uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, which means that uh, very quickly when we um, pray out in tongues, it may or may not be an earthly language. It might be one you know people speak in, in this world, but it might be from heaven, which means that when we speak it, though people might understand it, we should go with the expectation that people won't understand it. And in either case, we should, if we bring it publicly in this sort of setting, uh, expect an interpretation of that, which is also a gift from the Spirit. Because God is not a God of disorder, but of order. And the Spirit is a Spirit of self-control. Okay, and I know I'm whizzing. (laughs) And before we move on to adoption, I I do want to just remember Jesus' birth again. Because though he is glorious God himself, he was born in utter humility. 
in an animal trough, overlooked, unnoticed by his own people. You know what I said earlier? The least to the greatest? That's how the church is born as well. Because the crowd say, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Which isn't just a comment on them marvelling, how do they know our language? But rather, it's a comment on Galilee. Which was not a prestigious place. The Jerusalemites, the metropolitan, the educated elite would have looked down on them. Would have mocked them. But it is not the strong whom God uses, but the weak. It was not the noble whom he birthed himself amongst, but the humble. The ordinary, the plain, the work a day. It was Galileans who first proclaimed the risen Christ. Galilee was in the northeast. It was a maligned working class area known for its boats and fishing. Its people were were perceived as uncultured by its southern neighbours with funny accents. <laughs> <laughs> and so the disciples are dismissed as drunkards. Because that's who they were. God, do it again. <laughs> Reveal yourself to the weak, the uncultured, the maligned, the northeast. And proclaim your gospel. So, Lord, do it again. <laughs> That's not even my final point. <laughs> Pentecost is the anniversary of God's law written by his spirit on his people's heart. It is the humble birth of Christ's body, the worldwide church. And it is the promise of adoption by our Father in heaven. Romans 8 says it's by the Spirit that we are adopted as sons of God. Amen? Amen. And I mean sons at this point. Not just It's not sons and daughters. It is sons, specifically. Which is entirely good news. Because when we receive the Spirit of Jesus, we receive the sonship of Jesus. A male, female, slave-free, Jew, Greek, we can all claim by the Spirit the same relationship that Jesus the Son has with his Father in heaven. Another way to understand it is this. Jesus tells a man called Nicodemus in John's Gospel that to enter into this relationship we need to be born again. Jesus says in that encounter, when the Spirit blows, as it does at Pentecost, when the Spirit blows, when the wind blows, when the breath of God that Ezekiel prophesied over dry bones blows, the dead are brought to life and we are born again. Not literally, but spiritually, to a new parenthood. No, no longer children of mere men, but children of God. Reborn. Adopted. Always was saying that by the infilling of the Spirit, we are now sons of God. And not only sons, but heirs. Because now that God is our Father, He doesn't hold back any good gift. That's our inheritance. And it's for today. There will come a day when we receive our inheritance in full, when we see Him on that great day. But right now, you can receive the Spirit. We sung it earlier, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is alive in us today. It is a promise, a down payment of the inheritance that is to come. And what are these gifts he gives us? Gifts of service, gifts of speech. But how about this for a list? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the gifts of the Spirit by the Father. The gifts of the Father by the Spirit, rather. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I want that. 
I don't know about you, I want that. You see, the wind, the fire, the languages, these are outward symbols of an inward occurrence. The disciples were filled with the Spirit and they were changed. And there, there are lots of different words throughout the Bible, throughout Acts even, uh, for this, this filling. You might see baptism, which implies like a, a total immersion in the Spirit. You might see pouring out. I think it's Bruce Milne, he says that when the Spirit is poured out, it's like water pulled out, you're never going to get it back. It goes everywhere. You receive the Spirit, it's all the same thing. And the point is, it's continuous. Because you can listen to this and go, well, what, what do I do with this? Well, first you have to follow Jesus, you believe in him. We see that in our Exodus narrative, don't we? Salvation first. Baptism. Communion. Filling with the Spirit. Actually, the order gets messed around in Acts 10. You know, they receive the Spirit before they get baptized. So if you haven't ticked all the boxes, don't panic too much. But you need to know Jesus first, and then he will fill you with his spirit. <laughs> but that means if you've never been filled with the spirit, you can be filled. If you've been filled with the spirit before, you can be filled. Okay, we're clear? It's continuous. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That by your death, your resurrection, and the pouring out of your spirit, we are called sons of God. And we come now to our Father boldly and receive all that you have for us, all the love, all the joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness gentleness, faithfulness, self-control of the Father. Come to us, we pray. Amen.